<coughs> Thank you very much, John. Thank you, uh, Richard, for this invitation. Uh, the title of the John Wright was uh, Hospitality and the Provocation of God. Um, I also thought maybe you're calling it the Trouble with God. I thought that my opening line is God is trouble. And I thought that if David would to make fun of the Blessed Mother, I can say if I can be a little sacrilegious about God. Um, those of you who have copies of this thing, I'm going to be doing a certain amount of skipping, so hang in there. First section, the name of God. God is trouble. The name of God is the name of trouble, the name of a disturbance. It solicits us and visits itself upon us, like an uninvited stranger knocking at our door. It is a provocation and an interruption, venerable but dangerous, healing but quite poisonous, grounding but no less destabilizing, an ancient archaic but very and archival. From of old, it has perplexed us and driven us quite mad with love and justice, with passion and rage, with madness of almost every kind. It gives the urge to kill, or to risk being killed, a perfect alibi. The ambiguity and undecidable are not accidental, not a simple slip or fault in an otherwise pure essence that can be cleaned up and eliminated. They are constitutive, built right in, because the name of God is the name of a limit state an extremity, the name in which we are driven to an extreme, our faculties stretched beyond themselves, beyond the possible, to the impossible. The people of God are, for better or worse, impossible people. People with a taste for the impossible, with a taste for the worst violence, and for the most radical peace. Is it enough to speak of the undecidability of this name? Or might we go farther and say, it is the name of undecidability itself, of the transitions and passages that transpire between things, between words and things, between words and other words. It is perhaps a name of the irreducible restiveness of our lives of a dream and a desire, a prayer and a tear, of a restless impatience, a desire for being otherwise, which may, of course, make things worse, a name which houses our deepest hopes and fears. I say, a name, <coughs> not the name, not the first, last, or only name. It purports to be the first name, and in its own domain, it is, which is why it causes so much trouble. And making trouble is not all bad. But I'm playing with this, the ambience of the word trouble. But it is only one of many first names, caught as it is in a chain of substitutions from which it can break loose only by ceasing to be a name at all. Far from being some human projection, the name of God arises as a response to a disturbance, a solicitation, a visitation by a stranger, an answer to a call, to the call of I know not what. It is a name we invoke, that we call upon when we are in trouble, but only if we are first of all called upon, asked to respond provoked for better or for worse to either extreme. It is a name we offer as a gesture of hospitality to the coming of a stranger, which makes our lives, our works and days, so many scenes of hospitality. If we invoke the name of God, we call upon God, we call only because we are first called, even as we love because we are first loved, 
to which it might be added that we hate because we are first hated. That, says Derrida, is the significance of the double yes, the we, we. The first yes of the call or solicitation echoed by the second yes of the response. Let us stipulate to spare ourselves an infinite analysis that by hospitality we mean welcoming the stranger. Granted that, I am trying here to be as hospitable as possible to hospitality, to make it as welcome as possible, to make it a guest of honor. That is what I have been invited to do, called upon when I received a, strange, a call from a not so strange stranger from Boston College to speak about hospitality, a stranger to whom I am very close. For this task, in fact, hospitality holds up very well. I do not want to treat hospitality as a passing feature of our being, something to be included on our to-do list when we itemize the virtues we should cultivate. I would rather say, in honor of our guest of honor and of the occasion of this invitation, that hospitality is what we are, not just what we should do. Beyond that, I say more, for that is not yet hospitable enough to hospitality. For hospitality is also the reason that we can never say what we are, and why every attempt to do so comes too late, having failed to anticipate the coming of the stranger, who teaches us that things are not what we think they are. That failure to anticipate the stranger, of course, constitutes the stranger. It is just what the stranger is, depending on, the mean, on what the meaning of is is. As Bill Clinton once famously said when he was talking about a secret that is not the secret of apophatic theology. <laughs> To say what we are is a way we have devised to make things easy for ourselves, to spare ourselves trouble, which on the present occasion would mean to spare ourselves God, a visitation from God. We say what we are only by looking back at how things have been gathered together up to now. To say who we are and to stick to it is to try to keep safe the circle of the same, which is the very definition of in-hospitality. Hospitality arises in response to a call we did not expect, coming from I know not what or where. This could be trouble. And the could be, but perhaps, is irreducible. For the non-knowing, <coughs> the non-knowing, please note, is constitutive of the stranger. Otherwise, there would be nothing strange. Like God. If you comprehend it, Augustine said, it is not God, not the divine stranger. But this is not exclusive to God. It is every bit as true <coughs> of the self. Quis dio mihi mania factus sum, Augustine said. I have become a great question to myself. It is also no less true of the world, including the so-called natural world, which means we cannot forget the animals, as David Woodward was saying. We cannot forget the animal that I am, je suis in Derrida's famous play with that. That is why God and animals have a great deal in common and why in the history of religion, the one is often figured as the other, like angels depicted on the, with the wings of birds. <coughs> angels are birds. When Jesus goes out to the desert to pray, he is attended by angels and accompanied by the wild beasts of the field, who provide Jesus with hospitality in the desert, in the Korah. Both God and animals are strangers that an excessive and inhospitable humanism would like to master and assimilate. 
Animals are en masse, we think, obtained by subtraction. Humanity minus the logos that makes us their master, said Descartes. God, Feuerbach thought, is just us all over again. Humanity doubled in an idealized, alienated form. Nothing strange about either one humanism thinks. Everywhere, humanism sees only the human, Heidegger says. Everything about hospitality resists such operations, which shows up in Derrida's amazing, strange construction, divin <laughs> animality. A strange construction, if ever there were one. Tout autre, et tout autre. Every other is wholly other. That's the postmodern contribution to the medievalist of transcendentals. Each and everything is something adequate with medievalism, constituted by an I know not what singularity or strangeness, which is the seat of the, seat of the claim it makes upon us. To the extent that I know who is coming, who is soliciting me, and why? I am in command, autonomous. Caller ID spells the death of telephone hospitality. It contains the interruption, ensures that I remain the master of the call. Then the strangest of the strange is reduced, and the circle of the same is kept safe, reinforced, shored up. So hospitality is more a matter of visitation than invitation, an unwelcome interruption rather than a planned conference. Because when Richard plans his conferences, I plan my conferences. We invite the ones who are welcome. We welcome the same. Just so, we're, hospitality kicks into high gear when we welcome the unwelcome. Otherwise, we are just reinforcing the same. Just so, love builds up a head of steam when we love the unlovable, and faith when we believe the unbelievable. All of these being so many fetching variations on the possibility of the impossible. So hospitality is not possible without this impossibility. It's impossible without impossibility, without risk. <coughs> without a willingness to put oneself at risk, without putting oneself out, outside, exposed to the stranger. It could be trouble. When to resist what is strange, <coughs> when to welcome it, that's what Richard always wants to know. Although welcoming the stranger involves a certain death to the self, a certain overcoming of narcissism, Hospitality is not supposed to be just plain suicide. I don't deny that. I just deny that there is a formula or a program that will decide for us which is which. We do not have the software yet to make this decision. The trouble, the risk, is irreducible. The God is trouble. The stranger is trouble. Hospitality. Hospitality is thus irreducibly hostility. There it is. Risky business. Putting the circle of the same at risk. Without the risk, it's just more of the same. Hostis, the stranger. How do translate hostis? The stranger. The unknown. Trouble. However it is translated, hosting spells trouble. I do not know if this is a friend or foe, a traveler in search of lodging or a marauder. Stranger is both a venerable figure and dangerous. Stranger is men, but God. Undecidable, but God. Are strangers and undecidability figures of God? Or is God a figure of the undecidability of the stranger? 
which is the figure of which? Is God the figure of openness to the other, of the riskiness that's built right into things, which is the condition of possibility and of impossibility of moving forward? I'm trying to begin with the name of God. Am I using or merely mentioning the name of God? Am I invoking this name or being provoked by it as in a prayer? Or do I intend to stretch, out, stretch it out like a patient etherized upon a table? I don't know. I don't even know if this distinction holds up. We used to ask this every year that uh, John Mazak has mentioned the conferences of Illinois, but every year that Larry Dow would come to Illinois, we would find some way to ask him whether he was using or mentioning the name of God. Richard used to host the round table. And uh, he said, you should be up here and ask, ask Larry a question. I said, no, 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 I'll give you a question and ask him. And I slid a question into Richard's pocket. And it would always be something like, are you using or mentioning the name of God? And uh, Jacques would say, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> he said, if I knew that, uh, I would know everything. <laughs> Either way, I am trying to begin with the name of God, without forgetting that the name of God is only one of many beginnings, depending on who and when and where you are. One possibility in the syntax and in the game of first names, as Derrida said many years ago in an early commentary on Le Prénom de Dieu, the first book of Aélène Soussieu, I am trying to begin with the event that is harbored in the name of God. I am trying to deal with trouble, trying to get into trouble. Second section is entitled Meister Eckhart Says. Uh, Richard asked me to do something includes of Meister Eckhart in here, and I, I, didn't, I may have done this anyway, but in any case, I'm answering his call. The scene of hospitality towards God is not something I have made up. The figure of the divine guest is reproduced throughout the history of mystical theology, including the sermons of Meister Eckhart, which have long held my interest. Meister Eckhart famously said, I pray God to rid me of God, most famously, probably said. Meaning, I pray that God, who can never be mastered and domesticated, to rid me of the God whom I think I have in my sights, under control. I pray the God whose coming is always the coming of the stranger, to rid me of the God who serves to keep guard over the circle of the same. I pray God to keep me hospitable to God, to the coming of God, which sweeps me up in the groundless ground of hospitality. Meister Eckhart said, I have begun with a few words in Latin that are written in the Gospel, and in German this means, Our Lord Jesus went up into a little town and was received by a virgin who was also a wife. As usual, Meister Eckhart takes some liberties with his text, which actually says, that is, in the NSRB, Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him, into her home. Luke is telling the story of Mary and Martha, widely taken in the Middle Ages as an allegory of the contemplative life and the active life. By the little town, Eckhart says, the gospel means the soul itself, the ground of the soul, which makes itself ready for God's arrival, for the coming of God, for the event of God's advent. An advent takes place on the plane of the event. Meister Eckhart's works, both the German sermons and the Latin treatises, are all about the advent of God into the soul, about the birth of the sun in the soul, and about the readiness of the soul for this coming. As such, they belong to the thought of the event, which he stages as a scene of hospitality, of the hospitality. The soul extends towards 
God. Eckhart's famous reading of this story is unconventional, strange, and defamiliarizing, contradicting Jesus' literal assertion that Mary has chosen the better part and that Martha is distracted. Eckhart privileges Martha over Mary on the ground that Martha is superior to Mary in hospitality. Martha is busy about the many works, the many material things, meals, linens, a swept house, that are needed to welcome Jesus and make him comfortable. So she's a figure of the Vita Activa. This is not a distraction, Eckhart says, but a gift she enjoys beyond Mary, who has only one gift, who knows only how to languish at the feet of the Master, Vita Contemplativa. When Jesus says, Martha, Martha, he repeats her name. That is a sign that Jesus secretly prefers Martha because she has two gifts, the active and the contemplative, while Mary only has one. Hospitality requires both gifts, a double yes. The double yes of hospitality figured in this sermon, is, is figured in this sermon by saying that the soul must be both a virgin and a wife. A Naporia that Amy Hollywood has explored with great inventiveness in reference to the Beguines, to whom Eckhart preached. His job as a Dominican preacher was to preach, to send them out, like I'm sure they do to the Jesuits up here, they send them out on the weekends to do some work, to earn a living and hear confessions, and say mass, and give sermons. His job was to preach to women who didn't read Latin. So he translated the Latin into German, and gave, and in the process, well nigh invented the German language, uh, and wrote these brilliant, memorable German sermons. And one of the groups he was speaking to was a group that came under the disfavor of the Pope, Beguines, which means they were doing, must have been doing something right. And they were, among other things, experts of hospitality. By a virgin, Eckhart means that in order to receive God into its home, the soul must be pure of all attachments, not only to worldly things, but even to religious things, to prayers and fastings and vigils which can deprive the soul of its purity and freedom for God just as easily as worldly concerns can. I can suffer for my own sake, Eckhart says, to show what a hero of faith, hero of faith I am, and not for God's sake. But the purity of the virgin, the Mary said, must be joined with the fruitfulness of the wife, the Martha said, with a life of works in which the soul works, but not of itself, not out of its own autonomy and resources, it's a critique of humanism, but in collaboration with God, whom it has received into its ground. So the soul must work like Martha, like a busy and fruitful wife, while also and at the same time being pure of attachment to its own work. For its sole interest lies not in being applauded for its hospitality, but in making its guest welcome. The soul is trying to make a gift of hospitality, an expenditure without return, not to reinforce the circle of the same. Hospitality means welcoming the other, for example, and exemplarily, God. Without appropriating or compromising hospitality, as a means of enforcing the circle of the same. The sermon concludes, that we may be a little town into which Jesus may come and be received. May God help us do this. Amen. Section three, events. By the event, I mean the restiveness in things, which makes things stir with something coming. 
events, Deleuze says, are not what happens, but what is going on in what happens. Which means that when something comes, something unexpected, a surprise, that is the coming, the advent of the event. Uh, I think you can work Deleuze and Derrida together in, in this way. Events are expressed in names and realized in things, which is why we are never imprisoned by names, but always delivered over by them to things. And that is also why things are never boldly and immediately given, but always already named, interpreted, construed. Thinking, use that in a Hegelian sense, is conducted on the plane of the event, on what's going on in what happens. On an anonymous, quasi-transcendental field, coral and coral, a primal site of movement and rest, life and death, joy and suffering, friend and foe, making for a hostile, hostility <laughs> ground. To meditate upon the name of God to expose ourselves to the event that is contained in that name, all the while eluding the police of religion, of the confessions, and of orthodox, would seek not to welcome but to hold captive the anarchic energy of this name. To no avail, for the name of God, the hospitality itself contains what it cannot contain, contains the uncontainable like the Korotan, which is not purely and simply isolable from Kora, pure and simple, the nameless name in the demand. I am not interested in religion, but in God. Religion is what Meister Eckhart warns us against, fasting and vigils and observances. I go further. That's the trope of Meister Eckhart. He kept saying, I go further, I go further, and finally went too far in the book Kalam. The Pope, however, was a Franciscan who was out for Dominicans and trying to deflect attention from William of Ockham, who learned at least as much censure from Popes than anybody who was censured by a Pope. Um, I'm not interested in religion with God. I'm, I go further. I'm, I'm not interested in, uh, in God, but in the name of God. I go still further. I'm not interested in the name of God, but in the event that is harbored in the name of God. For the name of God, as dangerous as it is saving, as life-giving as it is death-dealing, contains the uncontainable event of a provocation, a solicitation, an interruption, and a promise to which we are called upon to offer hospitality. I pray God to rid me of God. I pray for the coming of the event promised and provoked by the name of God. I am praying for trouble. Now I'm going to skip all the way to the very end of that section for those of you who have comments of it. The axiom of any ontology of the event, where could, if you could have an ontology of the event, is that when it comes to event, to be is to provoke. Events are not present, but what is provocative about what is present. Where the tendency of the settled present is to prevent the event. We would not say that the event is, but that the event provokes. We, I would not say that God is, but that God calls. And whether that provocation is instantiated in some hyper-being or other is no business of this theology. The event is not what happens, but what is going on in what happens, what is provocative about what happens. If we can speak of a theology of hospitality, that would mean a theology of the event that takes its point of departure from the name of God, that feels about for the provocative event this name contains, without forgetting that every name harbors a provocation, which is why any name is deconstructible. It is also important to remember that this talk of names is not meant to privilege nouns or even verbs, and that the inquiry made by thinkers like Levinas and Marion and Michel Serre into the role of prepositions is indispensable. Meister Eckhart says that we must make ourselves adjectives of God 
Michel Zer says that angels are our adjectives. Very interesting book about in angelology and technology. Fourth section, Martha, or hospitable agency. A provocation is not an agent. Agents respond to provocations. The provocation of God is not to be imagined as something that God does, as if God were a super agent in the sky, mm. but something that takes place in and under the name of God, which is the philosophical wisdom behind the adage, God helps those who help themselves. Strong theology, which is a theology of the agent God, depends upon ventriloquy, people, men usually, offering themselves, authorizing themselves to speak in the name of God. Strong theology is megaphonics, ways men find to amplify their voice, and so to disguise their all to human, all to human will as the will of God. Hospitality to events concedes that agency is a matter of actual, mundane, and identifiable agents whom no one should confuse with God and who, above all, should not confuse themselves with God. There is no more salutary offspring of the theology of events, or what I call weak theology, than the recognition that it is human beings who do things in the name of God, which is why the history of religion is also a history of violence. God is not well described as an agent with mysterious powers to do things that for all the world seem to be the doing of more mundane powers. That is the very definition of superstition. But remember the agency of Martha, who was a wife who was also a virgin. The double gift, the double yes. She asked. But she acts from the ground of the soul, which is one with the ground of God. That means she is an, ag an agent who has been mobilized in response to a provocation, to an event that is figured by Meister Eckhart in the images of the Christian narrative and of the Trinity. The virgin part of the soul is to keep ourselves free from the illusion of an autonomous subject. That's the critique of humanism contained in the virgin thing while the Martha part is to replace that subject with a responsible subject, a subject whose action is the agency of the other in me, a hospitable agent. And I go on to say some things about the problem of evil in the next paragraph, but let skip that. The next section, I'm going to make this the last section for the sake of time is entitled, Perhaps. Perhaps the name of God is the name of perhaps itself, of the quasi-transcendentality in things, which marks Atva with Buddha, above all, with the possibility of the impossible. And then here I would refer you to the work, Richard's work on the God of the Possible, but with a Derridean. Perhaps God comes to mind as the name not of something transcendent, but something transcendental. Perhaps not something transcendental, but something quasi-transcendental. Namely, the open-ended and restless desire inscribed in words and embedded in things. The verconetus, as Spinoza called it. But not a selfish, self-aggrandizing one which would mean to build a fortress around the same, but a welcoming and hospitable canopus, which would expose itself to the risk of becoming and of going under, as Nietzsche said. <coughs> perhaps the name of this perhaps is the name of becoming, of becoming new, of making all things new, renewing things, which is perhaps what we mean by the kingdom of God. That is, the field or plane on which the event this name harbors and transpires. Perhaps the name of God, which we have thus far characterized as trouble, is also the name of the risk of the perhaps. So much God, so much trouble and risk. 
We might say, following the dizzying exchange between Sixieux and Derrida, that hospitality to the event turns on the undecidable play of the might. The suggestive slippage from the powerful might of God, the power of God Almighty, to the powerless power of the might, as in might be or might have been. The power of a sub suggestiveness or subjunctiveness of a possibility or a perhaps of an invitation or a solicitation. A theology of hospitality to the event depends upon the grammatic, grammatological slippage from the indicative mood to the subjunctive mood. Theology should be written in the subjunctive. It is all about subjunctions, modifications of the ontological into the deontological and meontological. What is disjunctive about the event appears grammatically in the subjunctive. It subverts the settled nominations and conjunctions of the present. That is why Hache Heidegger's famous analysis of the Anaximander fragment, Derrida locates justice, which is an interruption, a solicitation, a promise, in a disjunction or dislocation. Disjoining is the work of the event, which does not mean what the event does. Agents do things. Events don't do things. It does not mean what the event does, but the way the event provides the plane upon which things get themselves done. In terms of actually getting things done, events are a weak force, a powerless power. There is no force, no power, until a response is mobilized, which fills up what is lacking in the power of the event giving it bottom, where the point of the response is to make itself worthy of the event that happens to it. Which is why or how one would proceed to an ethics or a politics of the event. To speak of the weakness of God is not then to ascribe a failing in God, a flaw in the divine nature, as if upon closer inspection it turns out that God is strangely missing one of the divine attributes the way one would be missing a tooth. It is to re-describe God as a provocation. And as a provocation, God is provocative all the way down. Trouble all the way down. God is not missing something. To speak of the weakness of God is simply to say that the name of God is the name of, of an event of something unconditional without force. There it is. It's unconditional without force. does not have a host of angels, the host in hospitality, same host which belongs to hospitality. The name of, to speak of the weakness of God is simply to say the name of God is the name of an event, something unconditional without force, which is a matter of a might, a subjunctive might, not might, almighty, omnipotence, of a perhaps or a maybe, not a supreme being. The might and the muscle and the actuality is to be supplied by mundane agents. That of itself ought to give pause to those who speak in the name of God, who claim to act in under that name. They are responsible to God, responsible for God, for the being and actuality that God has in the world, for the way that God comes to exist in the world. They are responsible for protecting God's good name. Hospitality is a way to transform the world, to make all things new. Hospitality is a work of collaboration with more subtle forces, with uncontainable virtual systems, making a home for the play of events, without submitting it in advance to the categories of metaphysics, which impose conditions on events. Such categories are the means we have devised to arrest the play of the perhaps. Events play together constituting an open-ended whole, an internal complexity, a complex chaosmos, as James Joyce says, a non-totalizing, chaosmotic process of self-transformation, autopoiesis, auto-deconstruction, 
the complex play of perhaps. And then I skip all the way to the very end, concluding uh, up, 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 I guess. Yes, I said, yes. Come, begin, we weep. That is the prayer of hospitality, the prayer by which we are constituted, the prayer we are always becoming, the peculiarly postmodern prayer of a religion without religion. Meister Eckhart says that we may be a little town into which Jesus may come and be received. May God help us do this. Amen. Thank you. And I just want to let people know that anybody who wishes to have the full text of our different speakers, because they're very generously in, in the interest of question and answer, curtailing uh, the length of their text, uh, you can write to James Taylor, email James Taylor, and we can send you the text as well as attachments. So, Jack, you can take the questions from the floor. I'm less than speechless. I, I, like, I really like your God as trouble. Um, and that's the only kind of God that I, I um, can deal with. Um, but when I was listening, I was thinking, what about, I mean, this, this then becomes a serious question. What about the God who offers hope in the middle of hopelessness, who, uh, who isn't trouble, but the possibility of being saved or being helped or being uh, relieved from suffering. I mean, why, how does the God of trouble fit in with, with that God? In, uh, as the danger supplement, I mean, it's the, very, it's the pharmacological structure of, of the idea of God. It's that every promise is a threat. Every hope is fear. And they're inter interwoven in such a way that you can't simply extricate them, and there is no program to decide the difference. And so, um, the, the passionate commitment that the name of God evokes, and the promise of hope and justice, is always on the edge of spilling blood. And you can't sanitize it. You can't have the one without the other. Um, it, it's like. It's structurally almost identical, I would say, to the passion of politics, which is always on the edge of spilling blood and which drives people with equal earnestness to extreme opposite <coughs> positions and to, to the point of endangering each other. The name of God's like that. It's one of those, it's one of those limit names. It's a name for it's one of the names that drives us to the extreme. There's, and there are other names. I'm not trying to privilege the name of God. The theology privileges the name of God because that's what it is. But there would be other names that function like that. Like the name of justice or the name of love. They, uh, they're pharmacons. They're, they're drugs. They poison and they heal. They do both of you. Jack, could I bring you back very briefly to the, the notion, if I may quote you, both God and animals are strangers that an excessive and inhospitable humanism would like to master. And I, I found that very intriguing that you bring in animals at that point, and of course it, it connects with some of the things David was saying this morning. But my question would be this, why has the contemporary or modern, well let's say contemporary, philosophy of God and religion been so inhospitable or at least forgetful about animals and I, I mean that in, in, in two senses I mean if you think of Levinas, Paul Ricoeur, Marion, Lacoste I mean I won't go on, Michel Henry there's very little in their philosophy of religion that actually deals with the natural and the animal even with, in their own Abra Abrahamic traditions you hear very little about Christ the gardener who meets Mary Magdalene very little, very little of Christ the fish, who feeds fish to his disciples the first time he meets them, or bread in a mouse. 
you hear very little of the Franciscan principle of sun and moon and animals and reptiles. And I'm just wondering about this occlusion in the continental philosophy of religion, both within the Abrahamic tradition, and of course I should add the Son of Son, and both within the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, but also the lack of dialogue with uh, Hinduism or Buddhism, for whom all sentient things are sacred, who have monkey gods and who have um, uh, elephant gods. And, you know, what is the seclusion of the animal and the natural? Yeah. Uh, well, my own <coughs> hypothesis is that it's a result of the, the dominant the, the dominant strain in continental philosophy runs from Kierkegaard through Husserl and Heidegger uh, into Derrida and Levinas. Um, it does not. Uh, there's this other strain that doesn't get as much of a hearing, which is uh, the, the strain from Nietzsche through uh, it shows up in Foucault and Deleuze, um, and it's also the suppression of the philosophy of natural science. And, and of the natural sciences themselves in continental philosophy. So someone like Michel Serre is, is not as completely translated as, as Paul Ricard or, or, or Jacques. And um, the, 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 the continental tradition tends to be predominantly textualist, um, interested in history and text, not so much interested in the, the natural world and, uh, and, and biology. And consequently, the Bergson Deleuze Life process stream that 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 thread in kind of philosophy is a minor voice, not a major voice. But it's that's not why very, I yeah, but it's not very theological or religious. I mean, Bergson maybe, but not Deleuze or Nietzsche. Well, look, <laughs> that's what Obama said. He said, look, look, uh, look. <laughs> I mean, there's a long tradition, as, as you've just said, of, of the, the Franciscan tradition. I mean, there's a guy named Peter Howard, who is H-A-L-L-W-A-R-D, who is the bad Jew translator, who just wrote a book which he takes to be the real refutation of Deleuze. And that is to show that actually this Deleuze is, can be given a religious reading. If that's true, he must be wrong. Uh, and he says, look, what? There's a tradition that goes from Scotus Eriugena through Spinoza into Bergson and shows up in Deleuze, which is a philosophy of the world as the manifestation of God. And that's what Deleuze is all about. It's the creator expressing itself in creation. And it's the endless process of, of the creator expressing itself in creation. Now, when you hook up um, Deleuze with that tradition, with Scotus Eriugena or Nicholas of Cusa, then you start seeing, and, and it's happening now, in the last 10, 15 years or so, you start, you, you'll see much more of that Deleuze and religion. Uh, and then Deleuze himself will, uh, you know, Deleuze is a little bit like Derrida at this point. When, there are lots of times when he says the word God, he means it as this thing which tries to arrest the play. But then there are these other moments when he's not trying to beat theology up, when he'll speak about something as a kind of divine spark or divine intensity. So the divine for him is this moment of luminosity, and, and he'll often use the language of glory. So when the flesh glows with glory, that's the, kind of, that's the glory of God, he'll say things like that. And there's a tradition for it, and it's the one you're pointing to. And that doesn't get the hearing in kind of philosophy that it's not the dominant chord, it's a minor chord. That's why at lunchtime you, I said to you, uh, I've actually got more interested in Deleuze in the past few years. Um, and that's why. But Jerry Dunn, Deleuze, I don't want to prolong this, would say they rightly pass for atheists. Sure. It's okay. Which raises the question. <laughs> <laughs> but God is usually you know, something to do with theism or baby. Yeah, and, and um, there's, a, there's, an athe there's a proper atheism, right, for even the best theists. I don't have to tell you that. There was, uh, there's some hands all over the place here. So I'm not sure where to go. Right. The first one I saw was way back. Uh, in respect to the question, you said the dominance of Genesis took the chill on uh, it. Since offset stewardship. But you do have the scratch from the table for the dog. Yeah, you can also go back and look at Genesis one more time and forget St. Augustine and read it uh, in the light of its Hebrew sources. And then you get a book like Catherine Cowher's The Face of the Deep. 
because there is no creatio ex nihilo in Genesis. Genesis is is the gen is, is the genesis of the world from uh, the, the elements, one of which is very feminine, Tiamat, the, the deep, uh, the waters of birth that were born from women we floated in the womb. Um, so there's a whole other way to look at Genesis without uh, Augustine. To just kind of be the devil's advocate here, um, you know, you're talking, you're aligned, especially events don't do things, agents do things. And, and I, that sounds very near just another kind of, just like a, a whitehead metaphysics thing that, you know, you're coming up against saying, well, we can be, but only in such and such a way, and we can't be in this way, and neither can God. And so what's to prevent this from just becoming another metaphysics? In, meta, in Deleuze it is. Right. The person in uh, doubt with that. Um, for me, it's, I'm trying to steer clear of that because I think that um, when you do get into metaphysics, you, you, it is very, it's very hard to avoid totalization when you get into, meta, into metaphysics. And Deleuze tries, it's, 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 game, it's as good a game as there is in, uh, of avoiding totalization in, in Deleuze, but I wonder if he does not finally succumb, if there isn't a uh, kind of deterritorialization is so powerful in Deleuze that the, the, the actual, the, the actualities, the forms that things take in actuality uh, are so transient, so uh, effervescent, that they, they lose their, uh, you know, their, their obliquidness. Uh, so I want to try to do this on the level of a phenomenology. See, I want to say, and, so, and this is why I'm really ultimately close, much closer to, to Derrida. Now I want to say, the word justice, for example, the word justice, there's a promise lodged in the word justice, which is the, uh, the it, it's, we're, we're trying, we're dreaming of something in this word justice. Um, and it, it belongs to this quasi-transcendental field that we inherit as individual speakers. So I'm trying to maintain on the one an equilibrium between mundane agents and agencies and this quasi-transcendental field that we uh, dwell in. But you're you're right. That's and, and it's not white any. You know, it's not look at us. You know, as, as, as David pointed out, in five billion years uh, the Earth will be toast. It's, there's no uh, divine telos. So, hey, I'm not, not trying to do that. Jack, maybe one last quick one. Okay, I, I accept I the idea that the, the stranger does not come to us as, as something we can recognize as friend or foe. I guess right, the radical kind of open space possible my ability to be a host. So it comes from the outside, I guess, right? But the, the question, I think also you're right about this notion of the ability to an act. I appreciate the notion of the uh, kind, of, you know, kind of action in which it comes out that may be of the event. The question here, I guess, in the long run, is, is the danger of welcoming. The danger of welcoming, so far as welcoming one begins to act. I always think of the, the slave of the day, the dialectic here, right? That even in the, the, the acting into the main deal given to me, there's a kind of reflexive in which I become more, more competent. And incompetence, then through the action for the other, creates this paradox of increasing competence, increasing mastery, not matter, matter, at least, or bringing the person into the circle. So the question of the welcome, the danger of the welcome. I understand that the temporality of being made possible by the stranger arriving and opening up a new possibility that I had not foreseen. But any in that initial action, even if it's for the other, <coughs> the question of this welcome becoming tragic in the sense of a little bit of closing. So that was the other part of the problem with the local welcome, to actually begin to welcome the other, is to risk the idea in the moment of this, which is maybe a good thing, of turning them radical maybe into a kind of I can in a stronger sense. Yes. I think that's constitutive of the act of welcome. Thank you, John. <laughs>
the counter pleasures and immemorial silence, both from SUNY University Press, Fragmentation and Memory, World Made Skin, both from Fordham University Press, and the, the co-author of the forthcoming Seducing Augustine. The title of um, today's paper is Promise to the World of Sacramental Aesthetics. Speakers, I'd like to thank Richard and the other conference organizers for their hospitality in including me in this. Um, when I first discussed this conference with Richard, I agreed to say something about a sacramental sensibility. And then I realized that I was insane because if you look at the history of sacraments, it seems as if there is nothing more exclusive or exclusionary. Um, and it is true that I'm going to take longer to get to actual mention of the stranger than the other papers have, but it does come up. And I think that even before that, you'll hear echoes of actually every paper that's gone already. A glance at the history of sacraments, both in language and in practice, seems to make rather improbable the notion that an ethos or even an ethics which quickly devolves, in my case, into an aesthetics of sacraments, could be a hospitable one. Sacramentum first means a pledge of money or property, which is deposited in the temple by parties to a lawsuit or contract, later an oath of allegiance made by soldiers to their commander and the gods of Rome. The term seems first to have been used in its ecclesiastical sense by Tertullian around the year 210, roughly to render the Greek mysterion, by which writers like Clement of Alexandria designate the representations of sacred realities and signs and symbols which only the initiated can understand. In his influential early discussions, Augustine offers a useful pair of terms, the sign of the sacred and the visible word, making the given word a sensible one as well. Most of his theory, and sacramental theory generally, has focused on operant rites. But these very terms suggest the reasons that it is hardly novel to regard other things as sacramental. Usually people go to Christ, but sometimes, as we just heard, to creation itself. The semiotic element is important. The sacrament is a sign. As I get started here, I'll specifically note, but will in any case be obvious, that I am taking a reading, because it's the only tradition of which I know more than the various details, a specifically Christian, and indeed rather Catholic, notion of sacraments. But I do so precisely in the service of seeing if it opens up at all. Because if it opens up there, it can do it anywhere. <laughs> Sacramental rituals require some community within which their meaning is read, into which the rites themselves may initiate or further bind, in which signs and words are shared as if in a language. They set us, it seems, off from those who are not us, both those who are not initiated into the mysteries and those who cannot read the signs. Lewis Mackey points out in his discussion of Augustine, it is faith that constitutes the sign as sign. How do you know that what you see or hear is language, that is, meaningful marks or noises? The ambiguity of signs, which makes it possible for faith to regard them as such, also permits the deradication from significance. End of quote. Faith then sees signs. It is in itself a kind of semiotic will. But this would seem to close off any community of the faithful more than ever, at least if faith has already interpreted the signs, already constructed a system of propositional beliefs impervious to evidence and outsiders. If sacraments had meaning only among those who have faith in them, how could they ever be other than communally hermetic? Fortunately for faith, this version, whatever popular currency it may have, is hardly exhausted. Augustine's own conversion, we might recall, is a matter not of belief. He is intellectually convinced by Ambrose's neoplatonic readings of Christianity years before his conversionary drama, but of desire. Augustine seeks desperately not to be convinced of facts, but to be faithful in desire's direction. There is faith in this sense of fidelity, 
with its willingness to live, sorry, this faith in the sense of fidelity, with its willingness to live in the question and uncertainty, its knowledge that all could be otherwise, has its own place in the sacramental promise. Having faith in the reading of signs, such fidelity must also be able to speak, to read, as it were, aloud. Contemplating the curious Christian notion of divine incarnation, Jean-Luc Nancy writes in Disenclosure of a faith that would be nothing other than the courage invoked to say the strange, the strange, a divine body discerning. A sacramental fidelity might help us to make sense of this. Faith reads signs, and perhaps what it reads, what it says, is the sensible world discerned in this divinely corporeal strangeness. Contemplating the strange, or perhaps the mysterious, we note that in some ways the Latin marks a curious transition. The mystery is what cannot, possibly must not, be shown. To say, behold, I show you a mystery, is not to strip the mystery away, but to show that there is a mystery. The sacramentum seems rather more fixed, indeed bound. It is in this territory, between the contractual promise and the faithful mystery, that we can inquire into a sacramental ethos, into what it might mean to read the world as such a sign, always attentive to the conspicuous risks of entangling ethics with any more remotely theological. Again, just as fair warning, my attempt to do ethics does run into aesthetics, as do most things I do. Though he might seem an unexpected source, Nietzsche, in fact, sees the very possibility of promising as being at the root of ethics. How Nietzsche famously asks, do we breed an animal with the capacity, or in some translations, the right, to make promises? His answer finds promise in memory and desire. To promise, we must be able not to forget, and this not out of any mere passive inability, but from, he says, an active desire not to rid oneself, a desire for the continuance of something desired once, a real memory of the will. As active desire, this memory of the will is not just a recollection of having once willed, but a regathered willing. In promising is the will's own memory, the desire not to rid oneself of that desire when desired once, the will's fidelity to itself. In my own recent thinking on sacraments, which I'm introducing just to set up what follows it will be short. I considered the Eucharist and the practice of sacramental forgiveness, once called penance, later reconciliation, and popularly confession. The Eucharistic rite and the meal upon which it is ostensibly based enfold memory, incorporating the line, do this in memory of me, with the promise of return and a transubstantiated presence nonetheless shot through with absence. This is my body calls into the moment of presence, the memory of loss, and the hope of recurrence. This is not a promise only about the future, but neither can it ever be holy within the present. That's holy with a W. It does something to the present. It makes the present promising. We don't await it, not simply. We dwell in it, but in that dwelling is the awareness of the fragility of presence, the possibility, as absence means memory, of mourning. Forgiveness folds the future into the past as a sort of inversion of trauma. Neither forgetting nor repeating the past, it instead retells the stories of past harms in a revelation of new meaning, thus releasing trauma's grip on the future. No longer needing to conform to the image of the past, futurity is reopened in its unknowableness as a space of possibility. Divine forgiveness is already given in the structure of time. So long as time hasn't ended, and we all know what conceptual puzzles that would create, something other is possible. The promise of forgiveness is precisely the chance for newness. The very mutability of the material world, its capacity to shift from one form to another, which so perturbs Platonists in general, and especially Augustine in his reading of Genesis, the one just mentioned, becomes here a source of hope, the possibility of being otherwise. So in love we find the promise that the present is transformed by desire's intensity, such that it will be made into a memory for the willing being promised again. In forgiveness, we find the promise that memory itself can be made novel, and in this the future will be given its rightful uncertainty in which alone we can re-will. In both cases, we note the formality of the promise. 
not just the absence, but the defiance of specifiable content. Hardly a new point. In each, the promise is that which is promising. The sacramental oath is not only contractual, but promising. But if we move, as even Augustine was willing to do, beyond the defined ritual sacraments, how do we see the sign or read the word of promise in and even throughout the world? Perhaps what we experience and describe as promising here is what opens, whether what is opened is the newly revealed past, the present in dirty good morning and joy, or the future in its restored novelty. This opening draws or entices us. The world without promise is foreclosed or emptied out, a space of despair. As Georges Bataille has it, the absence of hope of all enticement. Despair, numbered by Thomas Aquinas among the theological sins, therefore bad, sees a world without promise. How, though, would the world entice us out of our despair, show itself as promising? The longest standing answer is perhaps in the Neoplatonic ethics of attention to beauty, which we might not follow in its inward turn away from the senses, but can follow as far as its urge for a discipline of attention to the beautiful, a discipline both taken up and troubled in Neoplatonism's Christian versions. And I swear this is going to lead us to hospitality. It may not yet sound like it. When Augustine pays attention to beauty, asking the beautiful things of the world where and what his beloved God is, his question is attention itself, and it is beauty that answers, beauty that simply in being declares God to him. As Jean-Louis Chrétien notes, the Augustinian notion of beauty as a voice in itself is more persuasive than the idea that the things of the world are an occasion for us to praise God. Beauty invokes our attention and provokes us to join it in praise, drawing us to itself as the promise of happiness, to steal a much later phrase from Stendhal. But the happiness here is nothing distinct from the promise. Because Augustine, more resolutely than most Neoplatonists, refuses panentheism, his vocal world is not saturated with, but traced by, the God who is nonetheless absent from it, who is said, but not found, in all things. Beauty remains a call, which is its own and only answer. It is in this calling that it opens the world, makes the world promising. As Chrétien puts it, Beauty does not take place, but makes space. It does not occur in a pre-constituted place from which it derives its condition of possibility as if it were coming out onto a stage. By taking place, it makes space. In other words, it causes this place here to arise in all its jubilant and heart-rending exclamation. In an only slightly more poetic rendition, Rainer Maria Rilke opens the sonnets to Orpheus, with the pure uprising of a tree, a tree raised at once in the world and in the ear by Orpheus's singing. Orpheus sings and everything falls silent. In the beauty of his song rises the space for speaking for, Rilke says, fresh beginnings. Place and time alike are opened by beauty and by the words of praise. Praise is a peculiar version of language in which the content is revealed as much to the speaker as to the addressee. It is a matter not of information, but of exclamation, even of the heart-rending sort. It does not inform us about the world, but rather opens it newly before us. So, when we praise the world in its beauty, we join in voice and praise. We do not describe beauty, but echo it, our meaning taking its sense in and from this sudden opening before our senses. We receive the promising in our astonishment. And perhaps, as Rilke elsewhere suggests, this is uh, in the Ninth Juno Elegy, we are here just to say it, to read the world aloud. Beauty imposes upon us the peculiar obligation of the very attention to which it answers. But even this is too simple, if we think of it as prettiness, that, as a reward for our attention, sets us at ease, telling us that God is in his heaven and all is right with the world. Chrétien suggests that there is within beauty a power which breaks presence, which separates and invites separation, a power of denudation and dispossession, a demand for itinerancy. Beauty in opening spaces does not securely enclose us. To be invited is to be risked, too. In this strange spatializing, an ethics of beauty moves away from that Platinian approach, compelling us to turn our attention inward, 
there to find that all beauty is one, that alienation is impossible, and that we must be wary of too much investment in our senses. I think we can never be overinvested in our senses. But our responsive openness to that opening, as we have known with particular vividness since Levinas, can hardly be restricted to happiness. Destitution calls us to, and we are as responsible to need as we are responsive to beauty. This call of the destitute other is not quite so distant from the call of beauty as it might seem. Beauty calls to us not merely where it rises up, but also where it is not, where what should have offered the promise of happiness has been destroyed or refused or desperately damaged. To continue with Chrétien, the distress opened in us by the devastation and growing ugliness of people, places, or things is another form of this harrowing experience of beauty. Anyone, he says, who destroys beauty seems to us to be profaning in some degree that by which the world really is a world, containing things that demand that one stop and consider them in the dual sense of looking at them and respecting them. To consider, to be responsive to the beauty of the world, must entail vulnerability to beauty and ugliness both, or to invoke real again. Lament arises only in the space of praise. We hear praise and we voice it in the double call of attentiveness. But in this, thin, in this synesthetic space, too, our mourning may arise and sometimes must. We mourn where we might have rejoiced, where the promise is lost or forestalled or destroyed. If we are insensitive to beauty and to joy, then the call of destitution is at best a Kantian burden of duty. If we are insensitive to woundedness and destitution, then the call of beauty is a frivolous aestheticism. We are drawn both to the work of caring for the other and to the joy of careful attention. It is in this doubleness of care and delight that we find ourselves returned to beauty as the sign of the promise, but always and only in dispossession, in the strangeness of what rises up, that divine discerning of the flesh, of the body as, unique bearer of speech, the very sight of any response to the appeal. The efforts to disentangle beauty and destitution, enticement and fear, joy and sorrow, <coughs> are also our efforts to tidy the sacramental promise back into a contract, fulfilled and finalized and kept. To read simple signs that inform us of a clearly defined divine entity, ideally one in which power is neatly divorced from vulnerability, one we can praise without lament. Much of Christianity does just this, but it thus takes the sacramental firmly out of the world, thus rendering the promise unsigned, the word <coughs> invisible. If we want to remain in the world, that is, if we want to make sense of the sacramental, we are recalled to attention. We must listen to what we see, or see, like Augustine, as if in our sight the world spoke, and we said it again. In attending to what calls, we hear the chance of hospitality. The first hospitality, says Nossi, is nothing other than listening. Nietzsche, too, links attentive listening to hospitality, writing in the gay science, this is a lengthy quotation. This is what happens to us in music. First, one has to learn to hear a figure and a melody at all, to detect and distinguish it. Then, it requires some exertion and goodwill to tolerate it in spite of its strangeness, to be patient with its appearance and expression, and kind-hearted about its oddity. Finally, there comes a moment when we wait for it, when we sense that we should miss it if it were missing, and now it continues to compel and enchant us relentlessly. But that is what happens to us not only in music. That is how we have learned to love all the things we now love. In the end, we are always rewarded for our goodwill, our patience, fair-mindedness and gentleness with what is strange. Gradually, it sheds its veil and turns out to be a new and indescribable beauty. That is its thanks for our hospitality. The end of the quotation. This is a lovely passage, but I would have to say, as one seldom does, that Nietzsche does not go quite far enough. Even here, beauty is strangeness that seduces us because we have not merely allowed, but carefully disciplined ourselves to be seduced. And we remain enraptured only while it remains a little bit strange a little new even in the comfort of its familiarity. If we listen for the call, including the call of beauty, with the idea that we know what we will hear or what we will answer, we have not listened at all. To be listening, says Nossi, is always to be on the edge of meaning. Remaining secure in knowledge of what the world signifies, 
we will have no idea and no way to discern what strangeness might arise before any of our senses. When we listen to another person, we listen to the call not only of her words, but of the world to which and from which those words call us, and in which those words respond, the world in which they can have meaning, the praise into which they can join. We try to hear the sense of her faith, not the list of beliefs, but that which gives sense to her world. Fidelity reads signs in light of desire. Belief here is first not propositional, but a matter of believing in, in the sense in which we say that we believe in what or whom we love. We listen not only for another's web of meaning, but for the astonishment of other desires. We can only attend to others' words and the world's signs together. To respond to the promising, we must retain the openness that listening is. But in this opening, we must be able to hear the sign, read the visible word, across faiths without reducing the other to the known. In this attention to the world mutually constructed with language, there is the chance of community at the sacrament of the mystery, not now as the secret sign designed to seal in those who belong and exclude those who do not, but as the mysteriously promising, which invites us together, invites us both to join in praise and to listen with. What we hear will be strange, as our words and the world's redouble one another, offering both praise for the world as it is and petition for the world as it ought to be, for beauty and want. I would agree with Dennis Turner that the petitionary prayer in particular, far from reducing the divine to a source of wish fulfillment, rightly reveals to us our own wills, our own deepest desires, our wills, I would say, worth rewilling. We must listen and look and touch and more. Divinely to discern the world is to find the divine in the sensuous, to say it as if into being, as we see that it is good. To attend with care as if to beauty is not only to discern strangeness, but even to make strange, to force oneself out of the known and the familiar, even in the face of the known and the familiar. So I, I'm sort of arguing that to welcome the strange requires a making strange of the familiar as well. That this isn't, um, it's not just that it's not unidirectional, it's not even two directions. I haven't counted them up, but there are many. And this is what art often does, for example, transforming rather ordinary objects and sounds and movements by the very act of presenting them for our attention. Famously, your own. To welcome beauty is to welcome that making strange, looking again at what was boringly familiar, the strangeness of art, of philosophy, of madness and love. Thus to attend to the strange and surprising is to run the risk of trusting in the promise of being seduced by the world, risking knowledge in favor of a learned and disciplined practice of being ignorant, of what is and of what is to come, and even of the meaning of what has been. But there is no promise without such risk. Its bond is not that of the contract, but that of the possibility, the mutual and certain invitation that we hear in the saying of it. We always have the option of refusing to make promises or to accept them, not just in a contractual sense, but in the sense of disallowing the strangeness of others and their words to intrude. We have the option of finding the world uninteresting, of refusing the discipline of desire that responsivity is by which we strengthen our will to will again, to say of desire, yes, always. Without this option, the promise gives way to determinism or predestination, and the open is closed again. The world and the other, destitution and beauty, and I don't mean those to be paired up, right, but both world and other, if of both destitution and beauty, call. They do not impose with the ineluctability of logic or physics. They call to desire to attend, to faith to say the strange, too. If we accept the responsibility of response to the call, it is not simple joy that follows. It is rather the far more complicated joys entangled in the passing of time, joys that fight against our own immense capacity for inattention, self-absorption, and carelessness. Any community that could claim to be gathered in faith would have to remain thus uncertain, attentive in its gathering, ritualizing not the contract but the promise, signed not on a dotted line, but throughout the sensible and spoken world. I know that emphasizing communities grounded in faith must sound awfully narrow, 
But I just read a CNN article saying that um, the more people identify themselves as belonging to these communities, and particularly as churchgoers, the more likely they are to support torture. And so it seems to me that, at least among Americans, um, and it seems to me that to suggest that a serious idea of faith as faith in a promise necessarily involves an openness to listening to what one cannot yet understand, we do help that much. <laughs> Mostly we don't like risks and uncertainties. We would far rather conceive of faith and community as forms of possibly false security, of beauty as a reassurance that we belong here, others as speaking languages we already know or need not bother learning. We are least willing to mix memory and desire, to doubly will by willing re-willing, to open ourselves to the risk of responding and the future of our own unknowing in the face of the strange and the stranger. We hoard our sacraments. We are willing to hold to the bond, but not to the promise of the possible, to the rights of the initiated, but not to the mystery. We want to respond by rote, without having to listen and knowing for the call. And we want the response to our own calling to be not another question, but an answer, preferably one we would have predicted. Yet answers foreclose the very mysteries that, as mysteries do, always question us. The mystery must always hold open the question, among others, of its own address, the question of who that we are and to whom we speak. Fidelity must be responsible to the hospitality of listening without knowing. And this responsibility is caught up, perhaps unexpectedly, in our right not only to make, but also to receive promises. To will re-willing, to make memory into desire, is to insist upon the vulnerable openness that beauty makes and that desire always is. Every promise dispossesses, or as Chrétien puts it, every promise receives itself and I receive myself through it in giving itself and in order to be given, but it must receive the capacity to be given, and from whom, if not from the other. The promised community, the community bound by the promise and by faith, says the divine body discerning the promise as the always strange sign of the sacred in the world. To be promised the world must be to dwell uncertainly in it. The community is gathered only by as much strangeness as it has the courage to say, by the faith that holds open the question, by the promise received through otherness. A sacramental ethics must always be open to the strange. This is the last paragraph. The sacramental world shows us a mystery throughout. It does not cease to call us, to seduce us, to draw us into response. In it, fidelity to desire is more important than propositional stubbornness. We tend to will only half of the promise. We will not to re-will, but to have our wills fulfilled once and for all. But promises do not come by halves. To live in a sacramental ethos, to see the sacred in the world, we must not only grudgingly, but joyously, will to re-will a mystery, and in it to hear the voice of the stranger in the song of its own pure uprising. So we have, um, I think we take uh, 10, at least 10, maybe 15 minutes. We're due to start again uh, for our last session at, at, at 3.30, but we're not going to. Uh, we can take kind of a shorter break, maybe 15 minutes as opposed to half an hour. And um, so have um, at least 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed that talk, Carmen. Uh, Thank you. Rich and complex. And I, I want to There was a line about place that was in there for you. In listening to it, I, I found two polls that I, I like to hear you either acknowledge or deny or reconcile. Um, one poll uh, was that of uh, attention, care, cultivation, uh, all, all that, that group of terms that seem to me to be tied up with the actual, the intent of the actual, what's mm -hmm. before you, around you, and so on. The other poll seemed uh, that of possibility, not mm -hmm. actuality, and, and this you tied directly to promising. In fact, mm -hmm. using, you even used the phrase, promising the possible, toward the end of the talk. Uh, now, normally, in usual ontologies, <laughs> uh, the actual and the possible seem to go different ways and diverge. Mm -hmm. 
So I was just imagining how those came together. They weren't really ignoring their topic. There was a tension, I thought, created <coughs> between them. So now I'm asking, is it the case that sacraments and beautiful things, one or both, not necessarily both, uh, are the means by which these two ontological modalities, the actual, the possible, are somehow held together? Um, ink and possible is made com possible. Uh, or are you saying something else about them? Okay. Um, is that what's special about them, uh, let's say? I mean, given this analysis, if there are indeed these two quotes in the paper, that at least orally, I haven't read the text, but orally. I, I actually and, printed off copies and they're sitting over there because I forgot, oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's fine. Sometimes it's better just really to listen. And I, I so that's what I heard in my listening were, were these polls. And then I'm just asking you and inviting you to talk a little more about how they might live together. Okay. Um, I wasn't thinking of them in ontological terms, so I'm not sure how intelligent an answer I can give in those terms. But um, let me try starting to respond from a, a slightly different position and see if it works for you. I think that um, I would begin in, in a discipline of attention to the actual. Um, and, and I do like the idea of a discipline of desire, of the fact that um, in disciplining one's desires, one can not only cut them off, but actually cultivate them and, and multiply and intensify them. So I was trying to suggest something of that, and that it is only in that discipline that we uh, make for ourselves any possibility of seeing or otherwise perceiving the possible. That is, that um, the possible is part of what opens up for us within the actual or even as a dimension of the actual or a perspective on it, provided that we have paid this kind of attention. Does that make sense? A dimension, you're saying? I might not have meant that. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> a facet would, might be better. You mean the other side of the actual, or do you mean um, something the actual already possesses? That's intriguing. Um, I think that I think of it as something that the actual possesses, but this, it's not a way in which I have thought about it enough. So um, I don't want to say anything very committal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's great. OK. Well, that helps. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I appreciate the open space that, that I understood. <laughs> but uh, I really love to be very precise. But I like the, your uh, distinctions between the face and the belief. OK, so the, in the introduction part. So your language of the face seems to be quite uh, comprehensive and also very welcoming, you know, the word according to my the reading. So I'm just wondering you know, how much the distinctions of the faith and belief uh, are uh, open or welcome to other religious people, as well as so-called humane secularist you know, groups. So the, uh, I'm just wondering how much the uh, language of the faith uh, welcome to other people? That's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, part of what makes it wonderful to me is that it's something I'm just now thinking about. It's right in the, the heart of my current thought, which means I will probably go on far too long in my answer, but I'll, I'll try to keep it concise. Um, obviously, I'm not the only one to think of faith in, in terms of other than belief. But it does seem to me, um, first, that there is something to be said, not just for faith as fidelity, but specifically as a fidelity of desire. Um, and that um, this, it probably has epistemological implications. And that's something that I haven't yet worked out. But I think one implication is simply that we must hold open the question. Certainly not every epistemology values that. Um, one value that I think it has for the kind of uh, what's often called interfaith dialogue of which you're speaking is that if faith does consist of propositional belief, I'm right, saying these statements are true, then at most an interfaith dialogue can be a kind of polite tolerance. I can say how cute that you believe that. <laughs> um, but 
I can um, admire the fidelity of another desire, you know, and um, accept and appreciate it in a way that, um, without even rejecting it, even if I don't necessarily adopt it as my own, in a way that I can't simply accept as true a set of propositions that are in contradiction with the set of propositions I acknowledge as my own. So I think that it is, uh, as you suspect, more promising in that regard. It's not something that I have worked out in detail, but my sense of it is very much in that same direction. Uh, thank you, Carmen, for that very intriguing talk. And uh, if I could just pick you up on one point, although it seems very anecdotal, if not tangential, the, the statistic about faith communities more likely to support torture. It was horrifying. Yeah. And it, at one level, it seems so at variance with everything that you were saying about the sacrament. So my question would be this. If the sacrament of the Eucharist, which you invoked at the beginning, is basically a communal act that remembers suffering for the sake of others, and a deep blood sacrifice for the sake of others, um, how do you account for the fact that it seems to almost be reversed in these faith communities where there is uh, support for the infliction of suffering in others? Is it some kind of per maso or sadomasochistic perversion of the original notion of sacrament? Or is it um, an ever misunderstanding? Uh, or is it something to do with the contemporary sense of the sacramental that simply doesn't get it in the way that you're talking about it and gives a totally, as it were, non-sacramental account uh, of suffering? Um, I think my inclination is to say number three, <laughs> the last of those options. Um, the tendency of um, a kind of what I call propositional stubbornness, an insistence on holding to the truth value of propositions without evidence <laughs> as passing for faith. And I think that if you hold to that, you're already in a space in which hearing anything else is a threat. And so um, to hear the actual voice of the other giving an unexpected response instead of the tortured voice of the other giving the information that you demanded in exactly the form that you wanted is a tremendous threat. So I suspect that it, it has to do with that shift in in faith generally as well as in the sacrament. Thank you. I'm sorry, my peripheral vision is horrible. I'm sorry, you may have had your hand up for hours back. Um, I think that one of the things that liberation theologies, and especially liberation theologies that have to do with popular religiosity, uh, have identified is that um, sacramental events can be powerful events for communities to resist the hegemony of the dominant culture. Um, I think that they haven't done a very good job of figuring out how to do that while also having solidarity with people who are outside the community. Do you have any thoughts on that? Beyond, yeah, what a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beyond. Um, well, um, my thoughts, again, they're going to be completely unformed, um, but it does seem, again, if we think in terms of, of this fidelity to desire as having much more of that potential interfaith openness, that um, we can both see our promises in our sacraments while at the same time um, being open to the beauty of other promises and other rites. It's kind of the same answer again, but from a different angle. Is that satisfying enough? Uh, I agree with you. I just, I haven't figured that out either. The exact how, yeah. I mean, what do you do with the rites? How do you teach people and so on? That's how do you do it in a way that doesn't just say, you know, the world is beautiful and sacramental and everybody's fine, but it still allows you to resist when people come into your community and try to and that's going to be one of those you can't predict in advance things, right? Um, when I was saying that the openness to beauty always has to be an openness to mourning, its absence and destruction, I, I think that it's a very similar point there. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed the talk. I, um, I heard you say one phrase which made me think along a particular line. It was something like Kant and and it was a pejorative reference to duty. 
yes. Yes. <laughs> and that makes me think of precisely how you're using the notion of aesthetic, because uh, I'm a great fan of Kant's aesthetics. And, and I just wonder, you know, where you're coming from with, with the aesthetic. Um, I'm using aesthetic here very loosely, uh, really, um, in part because I really meant to write about ethics. <laughs> I'm not very good at ethics. I was going to say at least at theorizing, but I might just stop there. I'm not very good at ethics. Um, and so when I tried to speak of what we ought to do, it kept going into a response to beauty. Um, and the idea of responding to to beauty and responding to um, the presentation of something as if strange, it seemed to me to be concepts that belong to aesthetics, but it's in a very loose sense. I'm not working out of a particular um, theory or position on that. And uh, when I read that passage, that line about Kant, I felt a little bad. I know he's much more sophisticated than that, but I had to say it fast. <laughs> Oh, yes, what about the delimitation of the notion of beauty itself? Um, I mean, for example, um, you know, abstract non-representational mm -hmm. art is not very much interested in beauty, yeah. but it's still art. Or, or even the, um, the ugliness of the, of the defaced and the deformed, um, which uh, is even stranger and also in a certain way, certainly lays claim to us. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, would you want to then re-describe that as actually a more oblique kind of beauty? Or, or would you be prepared to delimit this idea of beauty? Um, I think that's one of the uh, things that sort of went by the wayside in trying to make the paper fit the time. Um, we find a history of the kind of openness uh, and disciplining of responsiveness that I want in discussions of beauty, um, especially the Platonic and Neoplatonic, which is why I wanted to start with that. But I do think that um, our sense of beauty, but probably also theirs really, is a little too narrow um, for, uh, for what I want. That, um, we can start with that. We see the history there. We get some great ideas about, you know, instructing ourselves in re responding and in desiring even. But that we do then have to recognize that those responses uh, and uh, capacity for desire and, and for care have to open up onto things that we wouldn't necessarily call beautiful. And not just the sublime, but um, also even things that we would call ugly but are nonetheless stopped and stirred. So yeah, I do think that it's it's a limited idea. Historically, it's the right place to go, but you do need to go past it. Okay, I think we're going to uh, wrap there. We Thanks, start Sarah. again in five minutes, <laughs> which means fifteen. Well, thank you, Sarah.